Okay, now we're going to talk about denaturing proteins. Denaturation of protein occurs when uh, basically something happens when there's a change that disrupts essentially the structure of the protein. Uh, these disruptions primarily occur in the secondary, tertiary, or quaternary um, levels of the protein structure. And a variety of causes um, can make this uh, change that causes the protein to denature. And pretty much what happens is, say you've got a active protein that has some structure, and I'll just draw a squiggly line um, here to represent the protein. Now, of course, it might have uh, alpha helices and beta pleats in the structure as well as maybe disulfide linkages or other interactions, whether it be uh, intermolecular forces or covalent bonds, the salt bridges we talked about between the different amino acids. It could even be a uh, protein complex with, say, a second protein interacting somehow, some way with it. And a change occurs. And the change can be a, a lot of things that can disrupt the, the protein, depending on what protein it is. It could be heat. Uh, it could be uh, changes in pH, either the acid or the base uh, being added. Uh, metal ions, heavy metal ions, can also disrupt the protein structure. Uh, and even just mechanical agitation. And what happens is it basically changes the overall structure of this protein. Instead of being in the active form, say like that, it's something else. And of course, some of those intermolecular forces or ion uh, uh, interactions for the salt bridge have been broken. Perhaps even the protein complex is no longer associated with it. So uh, we take an active protein, a change occurs, and suddenly this is an inactive form of the protein. Whatever job it had in the uh, living cell uh, is no longer able to do. And of course this is uh, a core, uh, sometimes on purpose, our body uh, does some of these things when they digest proteins, break the proteins down to amino acids so we can use them to build up proteins that we need. We also utilize this denaturing process in cooking. We heat proteins, uh, we agitate them uh, in cooking, and then even we can add acid to denature proteins uh, for food. The next thing we're going to talk about are a couple of different protein tests. Uh, tests you can perform in the laboratory to determine uh, if proteins are present, and then of course sometimes what uh, specific amino acids are present in the uh, protein. The first one uh, we'll be able to talk about is the biurette test. And this uh, forms uh, copper ions form a purple uh, complex, a purple color uh, if peptides, uh, peptide bonds are present. Uh, 
Uh, if you want to just find out if there are amino acids present and so not peptides or proteins, uh, one test you can do is the nihydrin test. Nihydrin test, perhaps. Uh, and the nihydrin uh, molecule forms a uh, purple complex, another purple complex, but a different mechanism. with primary amines, which of course all amino acids contain. The next two tests we're going to talk about uh, have specific uh, amino acids in which they are going to test for. The xanthroproteic test Uh, test for amino acids with aromatic uh, side change. And it forms an orange complex in the presence of amino acids like phenylalanine tryptophan and tyrosine the next test is a sulfur test and as the name implies, this tests for amino acids with sulfur in their R group. Amino acids that contain sulfur, uh, such as uh, cysteine and methionine. Now the complex uh, it forms is actually a inorganic um, solid compound. Uh, you use lead acetate, which is soluble, lead 2 acetate, and react with the amino acids. And if the amino acids have uh, sulfur, this will form the lead 2 sulfur. Uh, precipitate and it's a black compound and so if that black compound um, forms you know you have a amino acid with sulfur on its R group such as cysteine or methionine.